Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. We're just going to wait for more people to sign in. Hi, everyone. If you're just logging in, we'll get started in just a moment. Hi everyone, we'll get started in just a moment. All right, good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We are about to begin. Please note that today's broadcast is being recorded. The Society of Industrial and Office Realtors is pleased to present this webinar, Forgotten Industrial Sites, Uncovering the Potential hosted by SIOR sponsor, Wear Malcolm. Today's discussion will last up to 60 minutes and we'll have time for questions and answers. You may submit a question at any time via the Q&A box on your dashboard. If your question is not answered by the panelists, they will follow up with you after the broadcast. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please message me privately and I'll be happy to assist you. The recording and PowerPoint slides from this presentation will be posted on the e-learning page of the SIOR website. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Frank DiRoma, Regional Vice President from Where Malcolm. Frank, let's get started. Thank you and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, we'll be talking about what we call the forgotten industrial sites, uncovering the potential. Uh, I'm gonna go through a short presentation on a, sl on a split level concept. And then we're gonna go to our panel discussion and Q and A. Again, my name is Frank DeRoma. I'm the Regional Vice President at Where Malcolm. And joining us today will be Luke Corsby, uh, Regional Director and Civil Engineering at Where Malcolm. Uh, Jason Rich, uh, CEO of Snyder Langston um, in Southern California. And Michael Luongo, Senior Vice President at CBRE in the Southern Markets and the West Coast National Partners. The forgotten sites, uh, we're, you know, these sites exist all across the country, including Canada and Mexico and all across the US. Uh, we're talking about sites that have a lot of topography, um, a lot of topography, which in turn on, especially on industrial sites, mean high development costs, more retaining walls, uh, earthworks. Um, and usually with these type of uh, high costs, um, usually these lands are not desirable. Um, usually the developers are looking for sites that uh, are, are pad ready or have, have very, very minimal site works. Um, and what we find is that these sites would come in uh, at a discount or at a bargain because uh, nobody's really looking or looking at these sites. I'm going to go through um, an example. This is a, uh, this is a typical uh Real site, you think it's from from an aerial perspective, you think it's pretty flat. Um, but you know, when diving into it, uh, the average forty three foot uh, grade over seven hundred seventy feet consists of slope ranging between five and ten percent. And um, the typical approach that a developer would use um, for a site for a site like this is is pretty much finding the the flattest portion of the site and putting the biggest building you could put on there. Uh, avoiding any site walls, minimize the, minimizing the earthwork. And if you look at this, uh, this next slide with some of the stats on here, uh, again, it's a 14 acre site, about 96,000 square feet of building uh, with an FAR of about 16%. And this is, um, 
this is not doing anything uh, anything in particular in terms of site grade site grading or retaining walls. So this is, but obviously this is very low coverage and and might not be feasible uh, to develop a project like this. Another concept uh, that many developers and architects look at is try to increase as much coverage as possible. And what by doing that, we do do some earthwork, either bringing in fill or exporting fill um, and adding retaining walls to a site. So we take the same example um, with, the, with these two processes and you're at four, a 14 acre site. Now you're at a building area of 171,000 square feet with an FAR of 28%. Uh, still it's low coverage. You know, everyone knows across the country, uh, you know, typical industrial sites want to yield at least 40 to 50 percent coverage. So, you know, with these two traditional methods, you're still not obtaining uh, the kind of coverage you, you would uh, you would see on these kind of developments. So what if we used some of the technology that we've done for multi-story that uh, and apply it to um, to these heavy topography sites. And when I mean uh, technologies, I mean, you know, proper, the base sizing, uh, slab thick, thicknesses, all these kind of concepts that we've, we've learned through multiple multi-story projects we've done in Canada and across the U.S. and apply these to, um, to this split level concept. So now we're taking advantage of the grade in our favor, and we're utilizing uh, the building, the, the ground floor uh, building footprint to add another, another layer of, of building to increase and maximize the coverage. So we take the same scenario, 14-acre site, and we put a bigger building on the ground floor. 205,000 square feet. We utilized a portion of, of the ground floor uh, basement walls as retaining walls, and we get more coverage. Uh, so we have a total area of 410,000 square feet and just shy of 70% FAR. Um, one of the things with this design, we we're utilizing the grade to our advantage. So it doesn't have any, any ramps, any elevated truck courts, uh, the, the building on, on grade has grade level trucking, including parking, and then the, the, the building on the second floor utilize an entrance and grade level trucking and parking on, on the second floor. And this is an illustration of that same concept. Obviously, it, it incorporates all the latest technology and good industrial design and, and, uh, and warehouse design that, that, that we do on an everyday basis. Um, show zoom in. Uh, state of the art office with amenities, ground level amenities, uh, patios, ground. Again, these facilities can be single user, could be could be two tenant users. Someone could take the ground floor, someone could take the, the second floor. It could be divided into four units. Uh, one of one of the items that we do sacrifice are dock positions. So if you look on the bottom right, there's a there's a doghouse that's required for the exiting out of the first and second floors. Uh, so on a traditional warehouse, you are getting less dock doors in this scenario, but you're you're still increasing uh, the FAR on the whole site. I'm gonna throw I'm gonna go through a a quick video. Again, this is the the lower truck court. Uh, an office on the ground floor with amenity space, lower level parking. And as you can see, the parking is at a slight grade, uh, everything to code, local codes, and it, the upper the upper level parking, you see how it slopes up. And then you get to the office area on the, on the upper portion of the site. Again, the upper truck court is at grade. Uh, this is a better, better illustration of the dog houses that I was, I was talking about uh, just a minute ago on the left-hand side. Um, that's the concept. So just to recap, 
before we go to the, the panel discussion, we're, we're really talking about sites with a lot of topography that are very difficult to build. Um, and then um, these sites, because, because of the topography, they have high development costs. Grading exercises are very costly. Retaining walls are very costly. Um, and then really what we're looking at is because of all that, these sites are at a, are, are more desirable in terms of cost um, and, uh, and are easily, maybe, maybe there's no competition to pick those sites up because no one's really looking at them. So we're going to go to our panel discussion now. Stop share. And uh, to kick off the panel discussion, uh, Luke, why don't you start by telling us uh, what the what the ideal site parameters uh, would be for a facility that would uh, utilize this design approach? Yeah, sure thing, Frank. Um, so I guess the first boxes that you'll want to check, you know, with these buildings being tall uh, and, and having high coverage, you just want to make sure that your zoning will allow for that. Um, but, you know, as, as we kind of looked at this prototype, we, we initially studied several different sites to just kind of see, you know, how things worked out with various, you know, topography, various, you know, site sizes, you know, configuration, et cetera. And, and what we found was um, that, that the site really similar to what, what we showed and what Frank showed in the case study was was pretty close to ideal. So, uh, what that what that turned out to be is you know a building that's that's around three hundred feet uh, works out nicely in that um, you can avoid generally a, a fire access road that kind of loops around the perimeter, um, which will help you you know increase coverage building footprint area. Um, you know we're, we're looking at that coupled with you know, two truck courts that are about 130 feet deep just to be kind of the, the industry standard. And so where that puts you is at a, about 600 feet of, of depth across the site, you know, in the direction of the grade change. Um, you know, you could be deeper. Again, you, you could be up against a fire road um, or, you know, in, in the, the case study we showed, there, there was actually um, trailer parking. So, so that kind of reduced building coverage, but, you know, provided that valuable trailer parking. Um, the other aspect that is, is really important is the two points of access into the site. Um, what, what's ideal is being able to come in to the site, you know, to the, the ground level, kind of independent from the upper level. Uh, that way you can avoid the internal circulation and kind of maximize the use of the site for you know, the required parking and, and the building of the truck courts. Um, you know, rectangular sites are great. So uh, with a, a complex building like this, we, we definitely don't want to have any odd shape to the building. So I think, you know, at least allowing for a rectangular pad is is cr pretty crucial for this. And so Luke, all that- Luke, what about the what about the percentage of the slope? I, I mentioned I mentioned that in that first slide was seven to ten percent. Is that is that like is that typical? Is that is that something achievable on, on these type of sites? Is that like really steep? No, yeah. I mean in terms of grades, you know, five to ten percent is, is nothing that, you know, especially visually looks to be excessive, but when you look at that that slope over longer distances, it, it creates challenges. So um, what's what's great about these buildings is, you know, generally you're, you're probably looking at a 32 or 36 foot clear building. Um, and, and so that that makes for about a 36 or a 40 foot floor to floor um, on the floor plates. And so, you know, that puts you really at an ideal kind of grade differential across the, the width of the site at about 45, maybe 50 feet, um, depending on how much room you have on, around the perimeter for, for sloping. Um, but, but yeah, the five to 10% isn't, isn't very excessive, but um, having that kind of be uniform across the site is it's definitely ideal. Um, and really what that does is, is allows for, you know, 
really grading to to handle the the variation in in you know the needed grades around the perimeter of the site and, and avoids retaining them. So, um, cool. Know, the key um, is the total grade differential for sure, not not necessarily just the slope. That's awesome. Thank thanks, Luke. Mike, uh, we'll get you we'll get you started here. Uh, what <laughs> what markets do you think um, something like this would be vol would would work? Uh, I know you're, you know, you're in this field. You're, uh, you're expert in this, uh, this kind of this kind of product type. Um, no, I mean, Luke, you hit on a lot of it, and Frank. I mean, the description of the site is, uh, is kind of what we're seeing. That you know, obviously, the cost of this site on a on an aggregate are obviously higher, right? So, like, that's going to limit your your markets just based on where you're going to be able to justify the rents to have the returns work. Right. But I think the one key element of this that that we found that's that's compelling is this is about making sites more cost effective. Right. Like it's sites that already are really expensive to kind of build on. This is about adding density to add some incremental value, adding FAR to kind of make it work even more. Um, and those are those are generally neighborhoods that are going to be coastal markets that um, that can support the added density uh, that that generally have kind of a heavy distribution kind of element to those, to those, to those regions. And, you know, so where we're seeing those largely are on the kind of primary coastal markets at this point, you know, obviously that can change and it's all kind of a, a rent factor, right. That you're kind of playing with, but, um, but currently that's kind of where we're seeing it. Um, but I do think the key, uh, the key point to really highlight on this is this is about, you know, helping sites that are already expensive and challenging to make them better, right? By adding FAR that on an incremental basis actually helps you then reduce some of your overall costs on an FAR percentage. So Jason, you know, and you're, you're obviously you're a general contractor. What, what are some of the challenges you see um, in terms of construction of, of, you know, some of the examples I showed, you know, the, the design and the site? Yeah, and we've had these across uh, these types of sites and projects across a couple of different market sectors. So we're familiar with it. I think the first thing I'd point out to most people is the additional due diligence. There is not a one size fits all dollar per square foot for a site like this or any of the sites like Mike described. There's also not a uh, one size fits all uh, solution, construction, grading structurally uh, for them. So they take additional due diligence to, to figure out you got to bring a team together to bring ideas. This is one of those get around the table and throw some ideas and and get some knowledgeable people that have done different things so you can find exactly what Mike said, the most efficient way to do this. Uh, how do you how do you reduce or eliminate uh, export? Uh, most of the sites like this that we've been able to figure out, was, you, you're able to do that, and that reduces cost and creates efficiency. Uh, how do we how do we take the shoring and either uh, have the lowest cost shoring system possible, or how do we take the shoring and combine it with the building structure so that we get some efficiencies there as well? Uh, you've already hit on some of the the topics about the ramp, and Luke was talking about uh, having access from both the lower part of the site and the upper part of the site. Uh, eliminating internal circulation and ramping, that's a, that's a big one. And so you take a site that you're going to have a lot of cost, site cost, site development cost up front. And then like from your examples, uh, if you kind of even just take a, your option two, uh, you're more than doubling the amount of square footage you have on the site. And the added cost that you're adding from what you would have to do for, for that first option two is probably in, the, in what we've seen, somewhere in the 50% range. So you're adding 50% cost, but you're getting more than double the square footage for that added uh, 50%. So those are some of the things we see, and I would point out uh, as the as the biggest challenge is bring people in early, you're gonna have to bring a contractor and an architect and put some ideas in that additional in that due diligence period, to be able to know what your costs are, because you just don't have a one size fits all pricing or solution. Um. I guess this is a question for everybody. Like, what's the biggest differentiator? You know, developing a site like this from maybe a traditional one. Um, you know, I think we've we've answered them a little bit, but I, I don't know, Luke or Mike. What, what do you guys What do you guys see? Probably Luke, maybe more on a civil perspective, and then Luke uh, and then Mike coming in from more of a capital markets kind of perspective. Yeah, 
Um, I mean, I think we've touched on it, but just to, to reinforce, I mean, you're, you're leveraging kind of sunk costs associated with site rate grading, um, and you're, you're getting that additional FAR, additional bar rentable area. Um, I mean, the other thing that, that is worth noting is, you know, you're able to buy a, a site that's really half the size that you would need to get that same building square footage. So with high land costs where this really makes sense, you know, you're, you're able to offset those increased um, building costs. You know, the other thing is, is like if you're comparing it to, say, multi-story, you know, those are extremely expensive in that, you know, the truck courts are structured. They're, they're sitting on structure. The, there's ramping that's all structured. So you're, you're able to take advantage of grade level, you know, truck courts and circulation roads and, and not have to, you know, put all that on structure. And, and you know, those, those costs are very significant in, in the multi-story product. And so this really is able to, you know, remove those costs from a similar, you know, two-story building. Yeah. Yeah. I would say too, the, anytime you do something a little more complex or <clears throat> I'll call it new or non-traditional, you, you've, you've got to have more of a team, um, a team together uh, and a team atmosphere. You're not able to just go do uh, it in segments uh, with specialties. You're, you have to bring everybody together. I and mean, we're sitting here on this call with an architect, a contractor and a broker. I mean, things that in the that the contractor may ideas that the contractor may come up with may be good ideas and may cost less, but knowing the tenant market like a broker would, they may be able to steer that in a direction or or, or give guidance to it. So anytime you do something more complex or non traditional, you're going to have to bring in a team earlier than normal and be more be more of a team rather than segmented and specialized. Yeah, and Frank, I mean, on that point, I mean, the market obviously for land has has changed pretty dramatically over the last year, year and a half as rates have gone up. I mean, land's the first kind of part of your pro forma to compress, right? In your model, it's your residual of your of your of your budget, and um, you know this uh, what we've seen and and how to pursue these sites, and we've got a number of them on the market now, even one that kind of fit that actually has this concept design on it that we're currently in the market on now. But um, in order to get these sites executed and, and sold or developed, um, you know, with third party capital, you, you do have to do all the work up front. Um, and the market's now moved in that direction. I mean, it, it is rare today that you're going to sell a large scale site, you know, unentitled uh, without any of the hard costs kind of fully characterized. And that just requires you to do that work. And again, I think what what this is offering to the market is just an ability to see a site from a different perspective. And does that added FAR really give you that incremental value gain? And and in some instances, it does. Hey, Frank, we have a question for this segment. Um, what would the choices for the solution be affected by bedrock being close to the surface? Costs would go up to remove rock. Yeah, I think I mean obviously the cost would go up if you if you're having to remove if you're having to remove bedrock. I think it all depends on it's it's another example of why these sites aren't cookie cutter and you can't just have a uh, one size fits all either dollar per square foot or solution. You'd want to look at where the bedrock is and isn't. How big is the site? Um, are there areas that you, you know you might be able to place the building in in certain areas or that there's less bedrock in certain areas? So. It, that's why I say it's it's one of these things that re, each one of these will require additional due diligence time uh, to go analyze those types of different site factors. Luke, was there did, is there something that pops into your mind? No, I mean I think you 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 hit it. You know, and and kind of going back to bringing together a comprehensive team. You know, a geotechnical engineer is going to be a critical component of this project, and and they're going to you know, bring to the team's attention that there's bedrock and, you know, dealing with bedrock that is shallow to dig, you know, a 20 foot or so excavation could have negative implications on the deal pencil. So again, you know, you've got to, 
be strategic on which site this this fits but um in concept you know i, I think that there's a lot of sites that, that this makes sense for um it's just you know working through all the challenges and, and seeing where it fits best yeah we've oh. had sites that had slope and where you hit rock uh the one thing about slope sites is you usually have a lot of different conditions so you might have bedrock in one part of it but not in the other part but every site is so different it's really hard to speak from a generalized perspective but um hopefully that helps answer that question um you know mike and jason being in southern california uh, mike especially you know have you seen situations like this sites like this uh that that have risen in, in in those markets um that you can maybe talk about or or uh, describe. Yeah, I mean, I can I can jump in. I mean, we have a we have a thirty nine acre site that we're currently on the market with now. It's on a slope. It's just right outside of downtown LA. This is it's going to be, it'll be one of the first case studies if it, if it actually executes that um, kind of builds this kind of split level concept and and a couple of things that kind of came out of that that were I think interesting and and kind of part of how you how you message this concept, right? One, this is not a multi-story, this is a split level, right? These buildings act independently, they load on either side off of each side of the slope, and, and they really can operate as independent buildings or they can or they can incorporate within each other. So there's some added benefits on that, right? Um, the ramping of these sites is not required, so that saves you a lot of costs. I mean, when we were underwriting most of the multi-stories and like info markets by the ports, Right. People after a point just kind of threw their hands up. Right. Because the costs and the feasibility of that second level was always one of the challenges. That is not what this is. Right. This is really kind of two stories maximizing FAR and kind of using the slope to give you that advantage. Right. So that's always that's been an education thing that we've had to um, really help the market kind of see through on this specific site that we're in the market with now. Um, the other thing that uh, has been an added benefit on this specific site and I'm going to be a little coy about what it is, and maybe some people on this call actually know the site, but is that the site that I'm currently marketing, it's a fill site. Uh, and because it's a fill site, it required the buildings to be built on piles regardless, right? So um, because of that, the added costs on the kind of foundational element of that site actually were already going to be there. And so adding the FAR um, actually lowered the total pro rata share on the FAR, you know, the additional FAR that was added. So in this specific instance, it was a really big advantage to be able to have that have that slope and build that density on top of it. Um, and um, you, know, you know, Mike, yeah. you 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 brought up a good point because uh, you know, especially multi-story. I think one of the one of the tough challenges, um, and this is definitely has some of the multi-story concept with two buildings on each other, but it's not it's not marketing like a like a multi-story because. Um, the challenges were is what are rents paid on two, three stories in the air? How do tenants get there? How do the truck, how does the trucking go there? So all that's really eliminated in something like this. You're really dealing with two single, uh, single story buildings on two different grade heights. So would that be easier to market in terms of, you know, uh, rents and stuff like that? Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, the biggest challenge of the multi-story was always how do you price that second level, right? And in this instance, that that second level is not really a second level, right? It's a it's a level at grade and a level at grade. So it, it becomes a lot easier for the for the market to kind of see through. Certainly, you know, you've got costs, you've got feasibility issues. You know, this is a concept that hasn't really really been proven out by most of the developers. So like, you know, it takes a lot more work to get them to understand what it is we're doing and how to price it. And it calls with Jason and Luke and really kind of understanding it. But the sophisticated developers, actually, they see it as a challenge that they want to they try to accomplish, right? And um, and so that's, it's been, it's been a really interesting sale. And I mean, we're still in the middle of it, so we'll see how it ends up resulting. But, but we have multiple large scale developers, uh, groups that everybody knows on this call that are excited to try to to try this concept out and and are not actually worried about the functionality and the, uh, from a leasing perspective it's really just more about the uh, the feasibility of the execution and um and then the cost to get it done yeah and we've seen it we've actually had a couple of examples of this in the healthcare market in in medical office buildings where we've done the split level and split site 
uh, with with parking and, and and the building and taking previously unusable sites because the slope was even more than a 10 percent and and doing it. So we've seen it in other market sectors work. And so uh, we and, and be be very successful for both the developer and and the community for the users to to take a previously piece of land that wasn't wasn't doing able to do anything with and and go do it. We're seeing some of this more even in the uh, in the multifamily uh, out out here as well because land is so uh, valuable and costly. Uh, taking plots of land that you couldn't build, doing some site work to make them buildable, and then putting uh, units on it. Same concept, split levels, more units, more square footage on a previously unbuildable or uh, even if it wasn't unbuildable, you could only put very little on it. And so you're getting a lot more value out of a smaller piece of land like Luke mentioned previously. So so we've definitely done it several different times in different market sectors. Um, and then we've also had the brownfield sites where, yeah, you have to put a lot into the into the site work, whether it's deep soil mixing or uh, enormous amounts of piles to go through trash or other things. Um, so we've seen it where you can figure out high site work uh, cost sites uh, and figure out how to get efficiencies and um, and and put more on those sites. Um, let, let's just talk about uh, industrial, just the general market uh, as a whole, and what we're seeing and how these can could kind of help. Um, you know, obviously, you know, in terms of construction materials and and construction timing. I know during COVID. Um, you know, there was a, there was a lot of issues with getting material, uh, getting mm -hmm. product. Um, obviously, starting to look at projects like this, um, do you see like a different trend in terms of the due diligence that's required from from all of us? You know, from from the construction, from the civil, and and probably from you, Mike. On the uh, you know, I I know I, I know uh, there was a point in time where sites, you know, everybody, all the developers were just looking for multiple sites just you know site planning all sorts of sites and now that kind of slowed down so i think people are just taking more time and more uh due diligence on a specific site as a whole uh, maybe you know it's open to any one of you guys to to talk a little bit about the due diligence that we're seeing now in the marketplace yeah frank i'll i'll, I'll jump in here um i mean you're you're exactly right um you know the 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 there's more luxury of time now. You know, you, you look back to 21, 22, and, you know, there was, you know, a lot of competition on, on every site. And, and the timeline to, to close on new dirt was extremely compressed. So you didn't have the luxury of going through a big, you know, significant due diligence effort. So now in, in kind of the current climate with, you know, tighter margins, you know, the, the due diligence is, is extremely critical on really any site, you know, especially something like this that's kind of new and unproven. So, um, you know, getting getting a, a comprehensive, you know, technical experts, a general contractor on board to, you know, you know, uncover all these risks associated with with a development like this or even a traditional development is is super important um you know you you want to be able to understand what your real costs are going to be and, and be able to to mitigate the unique challenges associated with with really any given site and so you know with with a clear understanding of what the hurdles are going to be as you know through the, the design and development process you know you you're able to have a, a, a better line of sight you know on timing costs and, and what it's going to take to get to the finish line and then you know all the pressure falls on us designers to to go as quickly as we can and then uh, you know also not to mention the the fun challenge of, of working through all the wonderful jurisdictions that we all work within but um due diligence is is super important and, and we're doing a lot of it so um reach out to uh, us over here we're malcolm and, and Snyder langston and cbre we're definitely here to help and that's uh that's our shameless plug for the day <laughs> mike mike what about in terms of economic forecast and what you see and uh, you know kind of on the same topic yeah i mean we 
we went through a really weird capital markets here in 2023. I mean, uh, really transaction volume really just fell off a cliff. Um, you know, just as like a barometer, you know, our team, uh, not not as a shameless plug, but I mean, our team, I, I think, you know, constituted over 50% of the industrial investment sales on the West Coast last year. And so as just kind of a barometer of the market, we, we typically in a year from deals that we list to close, we were in like the 90%, you know, uh, from deals list to closing in that year. Last year, we were under 30%. And that just means deals were repricing and the market was shifting so quickly that from the time you launch a deal to the time you close a deal, it just, the market was so different. Um, you know, I, I think we have now found kind of a floor on that. I think the, there's some of the um, dialogue now on soft landing, on Fed uh, talking about rate increases, rate decreases through the remainder of the year. Um, the lending market's kind of coming back and providing some stability there, specifically for industrial product type. Um, you know, the market's kind of coming back a little bit. And and you've also seen that with the tenant demand. Um, you know, 23, you know, the capital markets weren't, you know, the only thing that was impacted. It was the corporate markets, too. And, um, you know, we saw a real big development spike, obviously, through the pandemic. And a lot of that inventory was delivering. And so we're dealing with inventory gluts in, in certain markets like the Inland Empire, Las Vegas, Phoenix. Etc. That will take a little bit of time for us to absorb through, and that's creating some softness on rents. Uh, and you know, compounded with the fact that we had the port activity and the and the and the strikes that were going on, um, that just really led to a real stall out of all leasing activity through the 2023. So you compound stall out of leasing activity and rate increases it just with a bad year. Moving into 24, we've seen capital come back really quickly uh, and aggressively. We've seen our bidding activity move back up. We've seen bid processes really um, accelerate and um, and now multiple rounds of bidding again and and pricing discovery really kind of finding it finding its rhythm. Um, and I expect that to continue through the remainder of the year and then talking to all of our leasing guys across the West Coast, you know, RFP activities back up, tours are back up. Uh, we're starting to see tenants make longer term decisions, which is all good for the market. I think it's going to be a little bit of time before the rental markets start to see some real gains in, in some of the more primary areas like the South Bay and like the Inland Empire. But uh, but at least I feel like we've kind of found a footing and where we can kind of build up from. And, and that's given some enthusiasm specifically on developers to try to get sites now that they can deliver in a couple of years. Uh, because you're going to see, de you know, development starts fall off a cliff. You've already started to see that there's going to be a real lag on new supply. And um, and if you can get on a site now that's delivering in end of 26, 27, you know, you're going to be one of the only games in town. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of these guys are getting back in and really trying to get these sites going. I have uh, I have two questions here. I'm going to propose it. Uh, one of them is uh, this question, I think, is for Mike. How do you see rents impacted by a first story building without any skylights and ambient lighting? And I'll let you uh, answer that question. Yeah, it depends on the design. I mean, I can speak to the design uh, that we're currently working on. And actually, we're not all that worried about the lighting on that because the way that the site situates, you actually get some uh, you get some extra light coming from the south and the, and the north part of the site. And so, um, and the clear heights on these buildings that we're building are 36 foot clear. So, um, you know, maybe that means a little bit more LED. I'm curious to hear, you know, uh, Luke, what you think about this as well, and just how you guys have solved around that. But we're not seeing um, people specifically to the site that I'm, I'm underwriting right now and bidding right now, discounting that at all because of how the site is situated to kind of allow for the additional uh, uh, natural light to come in. Yeah, I could I could talk a little bit about the architecture for that. Like on on traditional um, warehousing, especially especially in in the market that I'm in, uh, not too many developers actually even put in skylights because of uh, water leakage and and product leakage from the roof. They they actually prefer uh, clear story glazing around the perimeter. And I think even in the design we have, there's. Um, uh, we can we can definitely accommodate uh, glazing along the dock wall, um, and maybe maybe uh, uh, light wells along along the perimeter. That's that's kind of a design feature that that could be addressed through the design uh, piece. Uh, there's another question on here. Again, this is for Mike. Um, question is: Assume there's a 12 acre site with 10% differential. Developing a, a split level can make sense. 
And this question is for Mike. Is there a potential user, data center, water production, et cetera, that could benefit from having a split level uh, that may meet certain needs of the user, example, stability of grading into the site, which produce more stability to the buildings? Um, I, again, we haven't really seen it yet, right, actually implemented, but I can certainly see situations where, you know, having the split level where you can actually load and you can kind of tie the buildings together, you can have the multi-story office that kind of blends out throughout the entire project being a benefit to a large, a large variety of distribution users, right? Um, I mean, some of the other, some of the other uses that you mentioned here, you know, data center, maybe, you know, we haven't seen that yet on the data center side. Obviously, the cost of the, the, the development on the data center is only a very small margin of the, of the total cost of the development, which is largely power related. But, uh, but I, I mean, I, I can see a lot of benefits that where you can have the buildings tie together a little bit more efficiently. Most of the conversations we've had are um, not really about that piece of it and more about like, oh, how does that second level work? And is it is it actually kind of, can it act as an independent building on its own? Okay. Um, let's go back to some other questions that are happening here. Um, maybe there's a question for Jason. I could uh, actually answer this also. Does the building wall on the higher grade be forced to act like a retaining wall uh, drive the cost of tilt-up or precast? Um, I mean, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Not necessarily are the buildings uh, tilt-up. It depends what market. Um, well, yeah, it'll depend on the market, and it'll depend on the clear heights between the two. Uh, you know, the two stories, you could get into, you know, uh, you know, if you're talking 30 foot clear and putting in two, you're talking about 70 plus foot foot panels. And so at times you'll have to, well, again, you have to go back and evaluate. And on a couple of these, we've had to evaluate what the building system is. Are we putting in steel uh, or, you know, and is it precast on the outside or is it uh, steel or, um, or another system? And so it, it definitely is something that the retaining wall it's something that you have to put in. And so the question is, is rather than build an, a, you know, your normal call it tilt wall, which might be the easiest way. We've done that at times with MSE walls, mechanically stabilized earth, where we actually, it was cheap enough just to go put the mechanically stabilized earth wall in and then just call it build the, in this case, the one we did was a parking structure right next to it. So we actually had a walk space in between it as opposed to combining them. And that became the most efficient. We have another project where we did the opposite, where we did combine it into the wall. And so we made the retaining wall a cast in place wall up to a certain point. And then on top of that, then we had we had steel uh, and precast and plaster. So uh, I, I think the main thing is there's a lot of different options of how to solve this. And um, there'll be a lot of ideas from, from different people. And that's why, again, pull in the contractor, pull in the structural engineer, pull in a a specialty subcontractor and you'll be able to figure out the the unique uh requirements of each of each site that each site brings uh and even in the market uh market sector or product type uh that'll that'll come into play as well so you know jason to continue with that topic there's a lot of questions just uh wondering about costs i don't know if we talked about that at all but yeah. um, just in general like I think you mentioned earlier about the premium. It's like fifty percent. You're you're yeah. touching it a little bit. Uh, there's a few questions. Just just in regards to the building costs. Yeah. Well, in general, um, the question I get asked uh, almost daily is when are costs going down? Just in the market, forget for the specific type. And so um, um, I have to tell everybody that costs haven't gone down. Uh, they've gone from you know, skyrocketing 15%, you know, each year in 21 and 22 to about three to 4% uh, increase in 23, which was uh, felt like a blessing, but everybody wants it to go down 4%. Um, so costs are still going up material. You, you asked a little earlier, Frank, about, you know, material delivery and lead times and things. And we definitely saw uh, very extended lead times and in 2021 and 2022 and in 2023 we saw those more stabilized but um but what we what we also had in 21 and 22 wasn't just long lead times 
was whatever they told us, it was going to end up being longer. So they couldn't even commit to what it was and you couldn't plan for it. So uh, not only did we see most things move back to closer to traditional lead times, I'll say, in 2023, but what we also saw is when they told us what the lead time would be is they could commit to it. Um, uh, the ones that stayed abnormally long and, and continue to stay abnormally long are electrical and mechanical equipment lead time. So everything from switchgear to transformers to mechanical units, those are still abnormally long and a, you know a year plus in some cases. The good news is, is when they tell you what it is, uh, they can they are now hitting those dates, whereas they were extending by double at times in 20 and one and 22. So we typically, the first thing we used to do in a, like a steel building is you're buying steel before you even start the project. Uh, we're doing the same thing with electrical equipment and mechanical. You're, those are your first procurement. And usually before you're even on site, you're getting the specifications nailed down in the submittals so that you can order those uh, immediately, if not before we even start construction. Um, most specifically on the cost of these, Frank, you mentioned the, the 50%. It's, it's one of those things where it's so hard to throw a number. And I told you there's no one size fits all for sure, square foot or anything. But what we've found in the different market sectors that we've done this type of thing, the additional square footage, like we're talking more than double on this, the costs are not double. And so um, they are more expensive than normal, but because of your sunk cost, so to speak, in a no matter what you do, you have a high site cost. Uh, we find that it ends up being, uh, you could call it an economy of scale. Your, your costs are not going up at the same rate as you're doubling your square footage. And so you're, you're, you're getting value there and you're having to in these sites, you have to get value for them. Um, they're like Luke said, smaller sites generally, um, where you're having to get more square footage out of a smaller site and you already have a large site cost. So you have to spend about 50% more, but you get double the square footage, let's just say. Um, and those aren't exact because it all depends, but that's roughly what we see. And it takes more time. It, it takes more due diligence up front. You have to bring people in, but in the end, we've seen them be very successful. All right, well, we're getting close uh, to the time. Uh, I don't know, Mike and Luke, are you have any any other insight, any other comments that we wanna, we wanna address? Uh, uh, I know I know there was a, a few questions of uh, some other examples. I know Mike, you mentioned one that's that's active in the in the market right now. Um, from our perspective, there are several projects that are in entitlements right now across the country. Um, I do a lot of site planning uh, from the firm uh, in terms of due diligence for for this type of this type of product as as we bring it to as we bring it to market. Um, Mike, do you see any other um, any other interest or any other closing comments? No, I think I think we covered a lot of it. I mean, I uh, I do think that this case study that we're working on right now is going to be a really interesting one, and um, and I'm excited to see how the market's going to uh, play it out, and um, it'll certainly be talked about. But um, I, I really like what the Ware Malcolm team has been able to come up with here, and it's solving you know, a much needed solution and in, um, in a lot of these infill markets that actually could use a lot more density. So, um, and, you know, on the capital markets front, I mean, uh, we're, we're just hopeful that the market continues to kind of solidify itself. And, and again, we're, like I said earlier, we're starting to see that and, um, and we're starting to see tenant activity come back. We're starting to see a lot of diversity of the type of tenants that are coming into the fold. So 3PLs are back leasing again. You saw a couple of new Amazon deals get done uh, in on the, on the West coast and there'll be some more announced coming up soon here. Um, and you've seen some new entries in the market, uh, cold storage is back. Uh, we have a couple of large requirements on that front. So, um, I think it's going to be, you know, obviously challenging, uh, you know, move forward with the cost where they are with rates where they are. Um, but it's This is where people can make money because, um, you know, it's still a little bit of a dislocated system out there. Yeah. And I, and, you know, one thing for the audience, um, this is really not a, I don't want people to think it's a multi-story concept. It's really a site to resolve site condition. And we're adding the multi-story to increase the coverage, which is key. And we've seen this in pretty much, it doesn't have to be Southern California. We did it. 
we did a few due diligence on very difficult sites like in Nashville, um, in, in places you wouldn't even, uh, you know, in, in Texas. So it, it's sites that uh, really have, are maybe located in a really good uh, location, but have really challenging uh, site requirements. And this solves that, that piece of it. Um, maybe Luke, any of your closing comments or Jason? I would say these sites, you hit it right on the head, right? What you just said, Frank. Um, I, I would say these are for people that have sites like that, that are challenging, but you got to enjoy a challenge and you've got to enjoy teamwork because it takes quite a few people to come in, put their heads together. And on the sites we've done, like I said, they've ended up being very successful, but they take, they take several, you know, a team of individuals that enjoy a challenge and don't get uh, dissuaded by the first kind of hurdle that comes in it's like you enjoy the hurdles they're going to pop up and you're going to figure a way around them to figure out how to do it more cost effective how to handle a tenant challenge when they bring up a question or something um you you can work it out but if you want if you're just in the traditional um you you might as well just go get a traditional site then these are for non-traditional sites um and for people that like challenges and like working in a team and it's pretty satisfying when you get to the end and look at taking something that nobody thought could have anything done with it um and and have it be something to work for um for the developer as well as for the community for the believers yeah I the think, believers yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's definitely not for the faint of heart um you know i think you guys Kind of touched on everything i guess one kind of example of of, of a, a, a test fit or site plan that we did was you know an, a, a developer that that owned you know a lot of acreage subdivided you know was able to develop industrial buildings you know throughout the site kind of got to the end of the road and it was a you know really undevelopable a lot of topography but it was a parcel. So it's like, what do we do with this? Do we bite the bullet and, you know, do all this grading work, build all these walls for a small, you know, 100,000 square foot warehouse? Does that make sense? Probably not. So, you know, their natural reaction was, well, hey, this split level concept actually works well here. So, um, you know, the, the timing wasn't great on, on that. And, you know, I think that, you know, as we look ahead and to, a brighter future. I, I, I'm confident that, that we'll be looking at that again. And, and I think it's a great candidate. So these sites are out there. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're definitely challenging, but um, nothing that, that, you know, a group of great professionals can't solve. And as long as there's the, the grit and, you know, willingness to, to really, you know, put in that effort, it's, it's, it's exciting. So no risk, no reward, right? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully this just gives people the kind of outside the box ideas uh, if they have a challenging site that, hey, there are things you can do with it. All right, uh, Jaina, right. I don't know if you want to uh, we'll wrap it up. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar. And thank you to our panelists. And of course, thank you to Wear Malcolm for sponsoring for uh, today's webinar. If you have not already done so, please be sure to register for the SIOR spring event in at the Omni and Amelia Island. Um, the early to bird deadline is fast approaching on April 2nd. Um, if you have any questions, please um, reach out to me at jhummel at sior.com and I will put you in touch with the panelists. Otherwise, the recording and the slides will be posted to the website tomorrow. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. All right, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.